What if I told you that the decisions your grandmother made decades ago could be affecting you today? Kind of hard to believe, right? But science today is showing us that this could actually be true through the study of epigenetics. I'll explain just what this is, but first, let's go back to high school biology class and cover some basics. So we've all heard of DNA. It's stored in the nucleus of each cell and holds all your information, but surprisingly, the whole thing is only made up of just four nucleotides that vary in their nitrogenous base. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cysteine. Cysteine always pairs with guanine, and thymine always pairs it with adenine. When you put these together, they form our DNA. This DNA is divided into genes, each providing instructions of how to make a specific protein. It's the different combinations of these nucleotides that allow us to create thousands and thousands of proteins, just like the 26 letters in our alphabet can be arranged to form different words and sentences with multiple meanings. Wait, so how does this DNA create proteins anyway? It happens through two major steps, transcription and translation. When both happen, the gene is being expressed. Transcription occurs in the nucleus and involves copying the gene of the desired protein. DNA serves as a template to make the copy, and the enzyme RNA polymerase helps make the copy, which is then called mRNA. It's almost the same as DNA, but has uracil nucleotides in the place of thymines, and it's only single-stranded. Once the mRNA is fixed up, it carries the message outside the nucleus and attaches to a protein factory called a ribosome. Amino acids, the basic units of proteins, are then brought in according to the mRNA sequence, and a protein begins to form. So now that we know the basics, onto the good stuff. Remember that epigenetics thing I mentioned? It refers to the study of changes in the expression of genes that is not a result of changes in the DNA itself. This means controlling what proteins are made without changing the nucleotides of the DNA. You might have heard that exposure to some harmful chemicals can influence gene expression by causing a mutation. Take, for example, the tumor suppressor gene called P53. It creates a protein which makes sure cells divide at a steady rate so tumors don't form. Carcinogens like tobacco smoke, though, can physically change the nucleotide sequence, resulting in the production of a protein that doesn't do its job. This can lead to cancer. But epigenetics shows us how we can get the same cancer without any mutation or change in the DNA sequence at all. Instead, the gene can be turned off and will not be expressed. Then, no tumor suppressor protein is made and cancer forms. But there are many other ways that we can change gene expression without changing the DNA code. The three main ones are methylation, histonacetylation, and non-coding RNA. Methylation mainly occurs when methyl transferase enzymes add a little molecule called a methyl group to DNA. This most commonly occurs on cytosines that are located next to guanine nucleotides, known as CPG islands. When this happens, it's like turning the gene off, like I showed you in the tumor suppressor gene. RNA polymerase makes its way down the DNA strand and is blocked by methyl groups in the way. So what happens now? The DNA can't be transcribed, therefore we don't get any proteins for that gene. The gene can only be turned on again if the enzyme demethylase takes off the methyl groups. Histonacetylation occurs when another type of molecule called an acetyl group is attached to a lysine amino acid of the N-terminal tail of a histone protein. Now I'll explain just what this means. Histones are proteins that the DNA winds around, sort of like thread wrapped around a spool. They keep the DNA compact and organized. Each one of these proteins also has a little tail of amino acids hanging off of them, called the N-terminal tail. One amino acid on this tail is lysine. This is the most common place where histone acetyltransferase enzymes can attach an acetyl group, or histone deacetylase enzymes can detach an acetyl group. Adding these molecules changes the histone structure and loosens up the DNA wound around them, so RNA polymerase can easily transcribe genes. While removing them tightens the DNA, making it harder for RNA polymerase to transcribe genes. Unlike methylation, which determines if genes are either expressed or not, acetylation can determine the extent to which a gene is expressed. There's a range, like turning a knob. You can have a lot of gene expression creating more proteins, or a little expression creating fewer proteins. Non-coding RNA is a strand of RNA that is transcribed by RNA polymerase, but doesn't get translated to make a protein. There are many types of non-coding RNA, like long non-coding RNAs, short interfering RNAs, peewee interacting RNAs, and microRNAs. MicroRNA and short interfering RNA bind to the target mRNA strand with the help of some other proteins and either destroy it or block translation. This way, the gene is silenced. The gene will be transcribed, but won't be translated into a protein. Peewee interacting RNA can also silence genes by binding to certain regions of the DNA. This tells the cell to add a methyl group there. Long non-coding RNAs regulate gene expression by binding to proteins like methyl transferase, demethylase, acetyl transferase, and deacetylase, and telling them to add or remove a methyl group or acetyl group from a certain part of the DNA. Changes in methylation, acetylation, and non-coding RNA give us our different cell types by turning off unneeded genes in each cell, or they can be inherited in your lifetime as a result of environmental factors like stress, physical activity, diet, medications, and chemical exposure. Some changes could be harmful and may lead to disease development, and some can just affect the way you look. So that's the basic gist of epigenetics. The study is pretty recent and there's so much we've learned. We used to think that sperm and egg cells were reprogrammed during formation, meaning that all epigenetic tags were taken off so that offspring could start fresh. But scientists have found that sometimes the reprogramming fails, causing some of these tags to be passed on. A great example is the agouti mouse. The agouti viable yellow gene is one that makes the mouse fat and yellow. All mice have it, but when it's methylated, the gene isn't expressed. This is the normal condition. But if the gene isn't methylated, it stays on. In a 2003 study, scientists fed pregnant agouti mice specific nutrients in their diet. When the mothers gave birth, though, the pups were thin and brown because the nutrients activated methylation of the agouti gene. Scientists fed the control group with a placebo diet and the mothers gave birth to agouti pups. This was because these different nutrients didn't activate methylation.